so we'll start with the, you know uh, careful physical examination whenever we have this uh, patients of the dh we'll start with clinical history that important as in every diseases even dh it is important so so whenever the dh patients comes we need to review all history all history of the patients including the drug history the occupational history as well as the typical symptoms that normally may present with the hemopsis cough dyspnea or any pre existing you know the medical condition so along with these all things we need to understand that there may be some uh, clinical sign that may represent that the dah is associated with like uh, the epic scleritis retinal vasculitis small vessel vasculitis or maybe like in the case of a wegner's granulomatosis the patient may have nasal septum erosion or a sudden nose deformity there may be some skin signs also like a leukocytoplastic vasculitis so even the history you know may give some clue that the patient may have dh and what is the etiology of the dh and once we finish this clinical history as a routine we will do the cbc kft lft but at the same time we need to send the cultures not only the blood but also to the affected organ including the urine the sputum so that we can at least rule out the other infection the urine is a very important part of any collagen vascular diseases so the dh urine microscopic examination which may show the proteinuria or a microscopic hematuria that is probability a case of a wegner's or micropan can be the dh so along with these so we as need to send the cbc kft lft for these patients all cultures wegner's and micropan maybe the urine routine and the serum nk that is a cnk and the pnk this is the special investigation to diagnose you know the wegner's granulomatosis chalk cross syndrome or many other immunological variations we need to send the anti gbm antibody also to diagnose the good pasteur syndrome the anti nuclear antibody also to further discuss whether we are dealing with any kind of a vasculitis disorders the rheumatoid factor because in rarely the rheumatoid also may present with the dh anti phospholipid antibody and total ige because chirk strauss syndrome also can present with the dh the complement 3 and complement 4 to diagnose further for the sle here what we are uh, uh, knowing that the nk is very important but at the same time the absence of nk does not rule out either a wegner's or a mpo or a micropan the cnk which is actually a specific antibody against the pr3 it's specific and sensitive for the wegners so whenever we found the patient with the dh or cnk positive we need to suspect the wegners granulomatosis very uh, specifically but at the same time the pnk is not very sensitive to any micropan chirk strauss or any other diseases but again the pnk is present that we can say that it may be the css because it's more sensitive towards the css or mpa or a posimmune glomerulonephritis the diffuse capacity for the carbon monoxide that is diffusion capacity dlco if we could detect it normally elevated in the dh so we need to understand that whenever we are evaluating these dh patients uh, as a routine that the cbc kft lft we need to send all the vasculitis panel including the ana ra cnk pnk total complement factor total ig factor so that we can reach to some etiology some diagnosis that what is the cause behind this dh now coming to the radiological finding if we show about the x ray if we talk about the x ray the x ray in a dh is very typical finding it shows a diffuse alveolar opacities and that are there in bilateral lungs this a reticular interstitial opacities and uh, I'll, i'll show you the x ray film this is the x ray film you know this this looks like if we go with the differential it may be the viral pneumonia it may be the ards it may be the pulmonary edema so this is the picture that comes with the dh and at the same time if we talk about the ct then the ct also shows a typical ground glassing starting with the central the cavities nodules and these all are you know showing uh, some opacification 
the lymphadenopathy is not a feature. So in the DAS, the pictures looks like uh, are we dealing with a failure? But again, the DAS, the symptoms are totally different. In the failure, the patient will present with the dyspnea, but obviously no hemopsis, no anemia. So indirectly, we can say the patients, because in the DAH, even the presenting complaints are maybe acute, subacute, but mostly presentation are within seven days. So sometimes we really confuse whether we are dealing with the failure or a DAH. But if we go closely, then we can see because uh, this, this typical picture, the crazy paving appearance is, is comes in only in the DAH. So after the DAH, it comes to bronchoscopy. There is a lot of debate about the bronchoscopy that when to do the bronchoscopy in a diffuse alveolar suspected patient. The answer is whenever we have, or we are suspecting DAH, we should do bronchoscopy as early as possible. Because the bronchoscopy is a very important to diagnosis of a DAH. In the bronchoscopy, not only for the diagnosis, we also can rule out the infection. Because if we are not you know, diagnosing this DAH early, we cannot target our therapeutic treatment to DAH patients. So during bronchoscopy, whenever we are taking the ball, we need to send this ball, the bronchioalveolar lavage, to everything, to fungal, to viral, to bacterial, all kind of bacterial, including the pneumocystis carinae. But at the same time, the biopsy is uh, totally controversial. I mean, my personal opinion, I don't think once uh, we are doing this ball, the serial, uh, you know, the increasing uh, the RBC count. If we see the typical, the bronchioalveolar lavage sample, then we see that in the first sample compared to the third sample, the color is significantly increased. The RBC count is sequentially increased. And this is a very sensitive, very specific for, a uh, for this uh, DAH. So the biopsy normally in these patients are not required. I'm talking about this TBLB, but at the same time, if this is a first time presentation for these patients, I mean, we don't know what is the primary etiology. The two scenarios could be possible. Like uh, we already know that this, the patient is a known case of a GPS, good posture, uh, known case of uh, maybe rheumatoid arthritis or any other diseases. And now the patient is presenting with some dyspnea, some drop in hemoglobin and a bilateral infiltration that is worsening, significant worsening. Here we already know that this, the disease is uh, uh, collagen vascular disease or whatever the primary disease is there, we already know. But there are second presentation could be where we don't have any idea about the primary disease. And this could be the first presentation of a DAH, even in these patients. So at that time for a diagnosis, since we are diagnosing with the ball and these all things, the diagnostic biopsy from a different organ like if we are suspecting the good posture or systemic vasculitis, the renal biopsy is immediately indicated in these patients. And along with the conventional histopathology, we need to do the immunofluorescent and the electron microscopy to differentiate between the SLE, GPS, or GN. If in the immunofluorescence, as we know, it shows a clumpy deposition, then it goes towards a favoring of SLE. If it's an immune complex deposition, then GPS. If it's a scanty or very no minimal deposition, then it's a posi-immune agglomeronephritis or maybe the Wilders. This is all about the further diagnosis if we require to, uh, uh, whether it's a collagen vascular diseases and if it is a CVD, then which kind of a CVD, which kind of a vasculitis it is there.